Well, good morning on this Monday, Thursday morning, uh, 2024, as we continue on with the commentary of the Epistle to the Hebrews, and we reach chapter 7. The title of chapter 7 is, Jesus a Priest Forever of the Order of Melchizedek. For this Melchizedek, the king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abram returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. Now in the, some of your Bibles it will say here, Abraham, but at this stage in his life, Abraham was still Abram. Now in this chapter I'm going to say some things which are my personal belief, and I will give the justifications why. Melchizedek, who was no record of father or mother, who has come out of nowhere to become the king of Salem, which also means the king of righteousness and the king of peace. Have you ever wondered why the son of a king is called a prince? We only look, have to look at royal families in the world today to see that this t tradition still exists. Have you ever wondered why Jesus is called the Prince of Peace? Simple answer, because his father is and always will be the King of Peace. That is why the relationship between Jesus and Melchizedek is so special. We know from scripture that Jesus in his spiritual form was speaking to Moses from within the burning bush. I personally believe that Melchizedek is a spiritual manifestation of God the Father on the earth at that important time in biblical history. It is also while Melchizedek offered Abram bread and wine instead of the worldly tradition of bread and salt as a sign of peace. It was the first reference to the elements of communion in the scriptures. To whom also Abram gave a tenth part of all being first by being by, the, by interpretation king of righteousness and after that king of Salem, which is king of peace. Now I have a problem with this translation of the scripture for the following reasons. And I want you to go back and check this against the scripture. Don't just believe what I'm saying, check it against the scriptures. As recorded in Genesis chapter 14 verse 12 in the Old King James Bible, at this time in his life, in this time in his life, his name was still Abram. So it should be written as Abram, not Abraham. God hasn't changed his name yet. And for that same reason, God can't change the words to mean something that they are not. In verse, in Genesis 14, verse 20, it states clearly that Abram gave him tithes of all. Now, nowhere before this time in, in Scripture does it state that people were required to give one-tenth of their harvest or their project as a mandatory offering for God. Neither Cain nor Abel gave one-tenth as an offering to God. One gave a sheep and the other gave some vegetables. It was never determined in Scripture that it was a tenth. The tenth was not mentioned in Scripture until Genesis 28 verse 2. At the time of Jacob and Esau's birth. Abraham died when they were both 15 years of age. He was still alive when they were, when they were born. When you look up a dictionary, you read the definition of a tithe as one-tenth of one's harvest or income given to support the synagogue or the church. Well, back at that time of Abram, there were no synagogues and there were no churches. This definition is not valid at this time in history when referring to Melchizedek and Abram. The translators have tried to impose a later historical fact on an earlier scriptural history, and this is wrong. You can't do it. 
if it was possible, then Jesus being a high priest, you could say then, because Jesus as a high priest can save all people through his blood, then it was logical to also transfer that back and say, well, the high priest in the old covenant could do the same. It's not right. And in this chapter, we see it's definitely not right. Without father or mother, that is, without descendants, neither beginning of days nor end of life, be made like unto the Son of God, abides a priest continually. This statement confirms my previous statement where I believe that Melchizedek was God the Father on the earth as follows. He had no father nor mother because before time and space existed, God the Father already was. Number two, he had no birth record of birth nor of death because God the Father will never die. Number three, but made like unto the Son of Man, Jesus said, If you ever have seen me, you have seen my Father. Number four, until Christ's resurrection and ascension back into heaven and his glory, God the Father was the eternal priest of the order of Melchizedek. Number six, when Jesus was proclaimed to be forever the high priest of the order of Melchizedek, he was answerable to someone in a position of higher authority than himself. The only person in the universe that is in a higher position of authority than Jesus is his Father, who delegated all authority in heaven and earth to him, except the Father withheld one item from his Son, the days to go back to the earth to establish his throne in Jerusalem and reign for 1,000 years. Now consider how great this man was. This is verse 4. Unto who even the, the patriarch Abram gave the tenth of his spoils. Again, see my comments above. You can't transfer a later historical fact back into the early history of the, of the Bible. Verse 5 is a, co a command. And verily, they that are the sons of Levi, who received the office of the priesthood, have a commandment to take tithes. When was the Levites established? After the birth. After, way after this event took place. And when did they get the commandment to be the priests? After Moses had brought them out of Egypt and received the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai. So I'll read that again. It's a commandment, and verily they are the sons of Levi who receive the office of the priesthood, have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law. Was the law given at the time of Abram? No. He was living under grace. That is of their brethren, though they came out of the lines of Abraham. The Levites, the descendants of Aaron, who are ordained into the office of the priesthood, have a commandment from God as per the law given to Moses that requires that the whole nation of Israel outside of the tribe of Levi must pay a tithe to the Levites being 10% of the growth of their harvest twice in every six, seven year cycle. Now, I want you to get this in the head. I'll just repeat it again. They were commanded by the law to bring 10% of the gross of their harvest twice in every seven year cycle. Not every Sunday. Number one, the first tithe of 10% shall be paid after the harvest in the third year. And this tithe shall be 10% of the gross of the harvest for years one to three inclusive. The second tithe of 10% shall be paid after the harvest in the sixth year. And this tithe shall be 10% of the gross of the harvest for years four to six inclusive. This tithe was primarily for the maintenance of the temple and to be used by the Levite priests to sustain their families because they were forbidden from owning land. As for the law, no planting was allowed in the seventh year as the land is to remain fallow. It is permitted to harvest any grain that comes up by itself in the seventh year, 
but no tithe is required from this harvest because this is God's blessing to the nation. This was the reason that Israel was punished for 490 years because for the 70 years that they were in captivity in Babylon, they disobeyed the laws of Moses and planted and reaped a harvest for the seventh year of every year that they were in captivity. Seven times 70 equals 490 years. Now every time that a Jew goes to the temple or after 70 AD to the synagogue, they were to make a free will offering at the entrance gate of the temple. <coughs> now, if they went to the temple six days a week, they had to make an offering six days a week. It was a free will offering. They had a choice. It could be as small or as large as they were prompted to give. There is no scripture which states that a person must make a tithe to the synagogue or to the church every Sunday. Sadly, that has been introduced by the secular traditions of denominations. It is supposed to be a free will offering. But he whose descent is not counted from them that received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promises. Firstly, Melchizedek was not a relative of Abraham, but still Abraham gave him a tithe. Melchizedek blessed Abraham. A person who gives a blessing is greater than the person who receives it. So we know that Melchizedek was greater than Abraham. And without all contradiction, the lesser is blessed of the better. And here men that die receive tithes, but there he receives them of whom it was witnessed that he lives. The Jewish people, though mortal, receive tithes, but we are told that Melchizedek lives on. He never dies. Who's the only people who never die? The Father and the Son, and all of us if we're selected to go to heaven. And as I might say, Levi also, who received tithes, paid tithes in Abraham, in Abram. For he was in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. One might even say that Levi himself, who was an ancestor of all the Jewish priests, of all who received tithes, paid tithes to Melchizedek through the father, his father Abram. For although Levi was not yet born, the seed from him came was already in Abram when Abraham paid the tithe to Melchizedek. Conclusion It therefore perfection was by the Levitical priesthood for under it the people received the law. What further need was there for another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? Why was it necessary for another priest to rise up after the law was given in the order of Melchizedek instead of in the order of Aaron from the tribe of Levi? Was it because the law was inadequate and needed to be upgraded so that a better covenant of Jeremiah 31.31 31 could be activated through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ? Just think about this. If the law which was given to Moses was good enough, why did God have to prophesy through Jeremiah chapter 31, 31 that he needed to give you a new and better law? Why? Because the old one wasn't good enough. If the Jewish priests and the laws of Moses and the 613 Levitical laws had been able to save us, why then did God need to send Christ as a priest with the rank of Melchizedek? instead of sending someone with the rank of Aaron, the same rank as all the other priests? The answer, because that priesthood was not good enough. For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. And when you change the law, the old one is deleted. Get that through your heads, Christians. 
For the priesthood being changed, there was made a necessity, a change also of the law. Verse 12 of chapter 7. I'm not making it up. Read it for yourself. Verse 13. For he of whom these things are spoken pertains to another tribe, of which no man gave attendance at the altar. For it is evident that our law sprang out, up, out of Judah. The Lord was of the tribe of Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning the priesthood. When God sends a new kind of priest, his law must be changed to permit it. As we all know, Christ not be, did not belong to the priest tribe of Levi, but came from the tribe of Judah, which had not been chosen for a priesthood. Moses had never given them that work. But God gave that work to the tribe of Judah, to Christ. And yet it is far from it more evident, for that after the similitude, which is the first model of Melchizedek, there arises another priest. So we can pl plainly see that God's method changed for Christ, the new high priest who came from the with the rank of Melchizedek. Did God Almighty make a mistake by handing down the Lord to Moses, which would not guarantee salvation? No. It was to make them aware that the blood of animals, even though they covered the sins of the people for one year, were never forgotten, and hence their salvation was never guaranteed forever. Think about that. This is the major difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. In the Old Covenant, they the blood of animals was put on the mercy seat and it covered your and it covered your sins they were forgiven for one year only but they were never forgotten but under the covenant with Jesus Christ his blood not only forgives your sins but it forgets your sins they are thrown into the sea of forgetfulness even though god knows everything he chooses not to remember your sins. Verse 16. Who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of the endless life. That's the major difference between the two. Verse 17 is a promise. For he testifies, you are a priest forever of, after the order of Melchizedek. Jesus did not become a high priest by meeting the requirements of the Old Testament, having to be of the tribe of Levi. He became the high priest on the same basis of the power flowing from a life which could never end. And even the psalmist knew this when they wrote of Christ. You are a priest forever of, with the rank of Melchizedek. This prophecy was made over 1,000 years before the cross and the resurrection of Christ. Verse 18, For there is verily a disannually of the commandment going before, for the weakness and the up unprofitableness thereof. This disannulling, that means the cancelling, for the law made, made nothing perfect. I'll say that again. For the Old Testament law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did, by which we draw nearer to God. Yes, the old system of the priesthood, based upon family lines, was cancelled because it didn't work. It was weak and useless for saving people. Do you realize that it was impossible to be saved under the Old Testament priesthood? It never made anyone really right with God. But now we have a better hope, for through the blood of Christ we are made acceptable to God, and now we may draw near and be reconciled to Him. Verse 20, And it is as much as not without an oath He was made a priest. Promise. For the Old Testament priests were made without an oath, but this with an oath by him, God the Father, that said unto him, Jesus Christ his Son, The Lord swear and, and will not repent. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. 
Verse 22, by so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. And they truly were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. The priests of the Old Testament were ordained as priests and then died. But this man, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood, which does not pass from one to another, but is now eternal. God took an oath that was Christ, his only son, would always be a priest, only to be Christ, he said. The Lord has sworn and will never change his mind. You are a priest forever with the rank of Melchizedek. The only person God the Father ever said that to was his son, the Christ. Because of God's oath, Christ can guarantee forever the success of this new and better arrangement. Under the old arrangement, there had to be many priests, so that when the older ones died off, the system could still be carried on by the others who took their places. But Jesus lived forever and continues to be a priest so that no one else is needed. Verse 25, Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing that he lives to make intercession for them. Because Jesus Christ is our intercessor and our advocate, as the high priest in the courtrooms of heaven. He can save all who come to him through his own blood offered on the mercy seat in heaven, made in the heavenly temple, not made by human hands. For such a high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners and made higher than the heavens. Jesus is therefore exactly the high priest we need. For he is eternally holy and blameless. Even though he took the sins of the world upon himself, he is unstained by sin, undefiled by sinners, and to him has been given a place of honor in heaven. None of the other pr worldly priests were given that honor. Who needs not daily, as these priests did, of the old arrangement, they needed to offer up a sacrifice, first for their own sins, and then for the peoples, for this he did once when he offered up himself. The high priest of the old covenant needed to offer up regular sacrifices, firstly for his own sins and then for the sins of the people of Israel. But Jesus did it once for all time when he willingly offered up himself on the cross at Golgotha. Verse 28, For the, form, the law makes men high priests, which have infirmity. They ain't perfect. But the word of the oath, which was since the law, makes the Son who is consecrated forevermore. For the people who were made high priests under the Old Testament law were not perfect. And the Old Testament law did not make them perfect. They had infirmities. But because of the oath given by God Almighty, sworn upon his own name, after the law was given, makes the Son, who is perfected on the cross, consecrated as high priest forevermore, and able as such, able to save all of those who come to him in every generation. And as we come to this time of this special time of the year at, at Easter, let us remember that Christ took our sins upon himself so that we would not have to bear the sin and suffering and shame of our sins and be dealt with in hell forever.